हेलो हेलो यस सर
Good evening and welcome everyone to the second part of the Global Tipping Point Summit. The first part of the summit was from the 20th of November to the 13th of December, primarily on education. And this is the second one from 8th of January to the 31st. A lot of parents have attended the education summit and today we have a lot of educators joining the parenting summit. This has been our aim, to bring educators and parents on the same page, along with students, librarians, counselors, and all who are interested in young people. So welcome everyone. Um, I am Dr. Kumi S. Vivaina. I am the founder director of the summit. I have been the head of the Department of English in the University of Mumbai retired in 2016. I am an education futurist, a literary critic, a writer, a parent teacher educator, and a storyteller. I've always been extremely skeptical of this word expert. I don't see myself, nor do my speakers see themselves as experts. We are all trying to find a meaningful way to relate to our young people, to make both parenting and education fit, fit for our young people. So the aim of the summit has been to create visible changes through very powerful action-oriented projects. And I'll come to this in a minute. We also hope with specific reference to this particular summit to cre help create mutually enriching relationships between parents and children. Usually when we talk about parenting, it seems to be a one way flow, what parents should be doing, but we should also be bringing up children to have the sense of responsibility and also have children working towards healthy relationships. When we first started thinking of this summit, we thought of a few themes and then we put out words, we did a poll, we got a lot of parents to talk to us and tell us what was personally meaningful to them. Based on that, we found the best speakers, I think, that we could possibly have found and I'm deeply grateful to all the speakers who have agreed to be a part of the summit. Uh, we thought of themes like addiction, which is now becoming a major social problem. So we have a session on addiction. We have a session on compassion, caring, and empathy, and how they can be taught from a very early age, especially with relation to nature and all of nature's beings. We have a session on creativity and how creativity can be nurtured in young people from a very early age, how parents can bring up a differently able child, Cyber wellness, which is of major concern to a lot of parents, how can we still maintain healthy relationships in cyberspace? We also talk about integral parenting, how we need to see the child as spirit more than matter to be worked upon, because the child does not come to us as an empty slate. The child comes with wisdom of its own. So we have that session on, on integral parenting. We have a very, very interesting session on the scars of shaming and different forms of shaming, physical, emotional, mental, et cetera. And we finally wrap up with in another very interesting session on how we can create awareness of social justice issues in young people. So the themes are very, very powerful, and I urge you all to attend all the sessions if possible. I know today most of us seem to be suffering from digital fatigue, but these sessions are only on weekends, so please try and make it. Now, a summit of this magnitude could not have happened with me working alone. 108 people are supporting me, and I have received tremendous support and guidance <laughs> from Dr. Feroza Godrej, whom I will now invite to say a few words. Dr. Godrej, please. Thank you, Kumi. Can you hear me, everyone? Good yes. afternoon. Perfect. Perfect. That was a wonderful introduction and a very joyous one. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here with you. I'm only representing part of the team, which is uh, made up of a very large and very important set of people as an advisory board. 
Uh, one of them, I think, is helping us with the technical side. Thank you, Yazdi, for letting me in, Mr. Yazdi Tantra. And we have wonderful core committee, as Kumi mentioned. I do not want to repeat what she said due to shortage of time, but the support has been incredible, both for the Global Tipping Point Summit for educators, and now, of course, the one for parenting. And I really must thank one individual over here who is the sum summit coordinator, Donna Reen. Donna, thank you very, very much for holding all the strings so that we can come and perform over here and say what we have to say. It's a wonderful summit. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very, yeah, very much you. on behalf of all of us. We're a large family over here and um, you're, you're very integral to us. Um, you've already heard some of the things that are going to be discussed over the next three weekends. And many of you speakers are personal friends of mine. You have mentored me, Father Joe. I can never forget that. Bitu Segal, who will be addressing us on the 10th of January, an old friend. But what brings me to this is the variety of subjects that are going to be discussed. And each one of us, each one of us will take something home from this GTPS Parenting Summit because we are nurtured by our parents who are our past. We are in the present with our children as parents and our children are our future and they will hand over the reins appropriately, I hope, to their children. And the fields that have been covered are extremely important. Of course, the creative side of it, which involves me particularly, um, the idea to let your senses go free the idea to not inhibit a child if they're trying to explain something. We are not all born as great Chopin pianist players or great artists like M.F. Hussein. We have our limitations, but we have a passion and we should look forward to that and we should encourage our children to look forward to that. It's a very strange time to be doing this summit, but there was no other way forward. And I congratulate the entire team and my co-advisory committee for absolutely standing behind Dr. Kumi Vevaina as she proceeded with this. We were originally going to be in a hotel. There may have been 100, 200 people who would have joined. But here, this platform, the silver lining to COVID-19 has brought people from across the board, participants, as well as mentors, as well as tutors. And I look upon all of you, young people who will be sharing their stories with us as our tutors, my tutor, I have a lot to learn from you. So I wish you a very, very pleasant debate, discussion. And uh, may I add over here that there will be a paper presented at the end of this summit. We want to add some value to it. We want to take it to the authorities and say, this is what we're all about. This is what our young nation is about. And this is what our young contributors, some of you are old enough to be my grandchildren, so without saying anything more, I will not stand between you and an exciting three weeks. So hand you over back to you, to Donna, Yazdi, Kumi, all the best. And may you go forth and give a fruitful uh, debate to our thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Godred, for these kind words and words of support and encouragement. Um, right from the beginning, the summit has been conceptualized very differently. And I will try and show it with this uh, quick illustration. We have a speaker, obviously, at the center, but the speaker speaks only for 20 minutes. The speaker has been working with four other people on a mini project, and they've designed a mini project. We call these four people the change facilitators who are going to provide three hours of training each, which makes 12 hours. Four people, 12 hours. This training is available to all of you online participants entirely free. If you are interested, genuinely interested in that area and you want to work towards change. So the speaker has four change facilitators, and we will take in 10 or more people from the online audience. So when the sessions are happening, if the session excites you, 
you could fill in a Google form and request to be part of the action group. What is your commitment? Your commitment is that you attend the entire training of 12 hours, and then you go out into the world, you create your own group of people, and you disseminate that information. You do it in very exciting ways, using art, craft, any of that. And then at the end of the year, you continue doing that for several months. At the end of the year, we will conclude the project. We will, as Dr. Feroza Godrej rightly pointed out, create a white paper, send it to the government, tell, inform people that we're not merely talking about change. This is a change that we've actually achieved. When we thought of the summit and even before the education summit, uh, my co coordinator Donna and I were really apprehensive. We started wondering how many people would really sign up as action group members. But to our amazement, 250 people really want to work towards change. And I think that's really laudable. 3,000 people attended the education summit. And those of you who missed it could go to the past events section of our website and view all the sessions. So this is the structure of the summit. And as I mentioned a little earlier, several people need to be thanked. So let me try and thank at least some of them. My advisory board, I'll start with my advisory board comprising Dr. Feroza Godrej, who just addressed us, Mr. Norshir Kurodi, who would have loved to be here, but has some other commitment, Mr. Norshir Ladravala, Mr. Sanjay Rastogi of Tata Trend, Ms. Shenas, Dr. Shenas Kama, Mr. Yasdi Tantra, Ms. Debika Chatterjee, Ms. Raki Chabria, and Ms. Fiona Reynolds. This is our advisory board. Donna, as Dr. Feroza Gozeritz uh, just mentioned, has been a major support to me. We've been working night and day, and any time is good enough for her for a phone call or for some, some kind of work on the summit. So a very special thanks to Donna. On the core committee again is Mr. Yasti Tantra, Ms. Deepa Soman, Mr. Milan Soman, Mr. Glenn Concesio, and Mr. Bhavin Shah of Education World and Parent World. We have partnered with Tata Trent, Tantra Tech, Merck, Lumiere Business Solutions, Education World, Parent World, Penultimate, Teachers Help Teachers, First Moms Club, and Wolves. And all of them have put in effort over months. A very special thank you to each and every one. We have received very, uh, I hadn't even imagined this kind of support at the outset but we have received very encouraging responses from people like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. That one day before the Global Tipping Point Summit on Education began, we received this letter from the Dalai Lama saying, I am pleased to know about the Global Tipping Point Summit and its focus on improving the present education system so that our younger generation can become more responsible citizens of the planet. And of course, the letter goes on, and it's a very interesting letter which we have on our website. We have also received encouragement from Sadhguru, who is the founder of the Isha Foundation. Sadhguru also says that we are touched by the GTPS initiative to empower the youth to be well equipped during these challenging times. And we are happy to share some of the quotes from Sadhguru to be a part uh, and Isha Foundation to be a part of it. General Shokin Chauhan, um, who is a recipient of five presidential awards for distinguished services in the armed forces, has also given us some very encouraging um, support. So has Mr. Kersi Chowda, who is one of the best known psychiatrists in India. Mr. Shyamak Dava, Shri M. Mr. Shyamak Dava is known to all as an internationally acclaimed choreographer, singer, performer, and entertainment director. Shri M, a spiritual guide, social reformer, educationist at Padma Bhushan Awardee. We've also done a podcast with Mr. Cyrus Brocha, TV anchor, theater personality, comedian, and author. 
and Mr. Baman Irani, theater and film actor, voice artist, and photographer. Apart from these, we have, as I said earlier, been supported by an excellent design team comprising Rhea Soman, Disha Uprati, Janavi Kulkarni, Rohan Siddhakar. An organizing team of Mr. Sharuk Vivaina, Dr. Nina Nair, Shalanta Mascarinas, Valerie Mendonza, Nagma Sheikh, Mustak Sheikh, Madhu Nair, Gautami Ambie, and Deepti Mazumdar. Our technical team comprising Faizan Charna, Ashish Kadam, Disha Poddar, Neha Vatsala, and of course, Glenn Concesio and Yazdi, whom I named earlier, have been contributing to the technical team. So a big thank you to everyone. And today we have for you three wonderful speakers who are going to talk about some very exciting dimensions of parenting. So I'm very, very happy to welcome Ms. Salian de la Casa from Dubai, Dr. Sujata Sriram from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and Mr. R. Sridhar, who is well known as an excellent ideator. So I, with this, I hand over the session to the CEO of First Moms Club and a very dear friend of mine, Ruchita Darsha. Welcome, Ruchita, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'm going to now ask the most common answer, a question that has been asked. Can everyone hear me? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Kumi, ma'am. Thank you for trusting me to anchor the inaugural session of GTPS. Um, hello, I am Ruchita Darsha, and I'm the founder of First Moms Club. First Moms Club is an online community that I started over 10 years ago to connect moms over motherhood, parenting, children, careers, basically anything that a mother goes through her entire journey. Today, we connect lakhs of Indian moms across 100 countries through our website and, of course, the various social media platforms. When Kumi Ma'am approached us to partner the GTPS Summit, while we were super stoked to be part of this initiative, one of the first things I told her was that, Ma'am, parents don't really attend parenting summits. I know I shocked her, and but that's the truth, uh, because you know we parents think that we know our job, and you know nobody can tell us better. But you see, or at least I believe that each child is unique, and yes, of course, each parent too. But parenting is actually about constantly learning on the job and one never becomes an expert, right? But you can definitely get better. Um, and I, you know, I, if I were to actually connect it to today's world, I would say that parenting is a bit like a social media platform, right? Whenever you think you've got the hang of it, there's a new feature that gets added and, oh my God, you're trying to figure it out. And that's exactly what happens with parenting. You know, when you think you've cracked the code, uh, there is a new challenge or there's something new that comes up and you have to overcome it. And I think that's why this summit, which is about rethinking parenting is exactly what we all need today. Because as much as we parents would love to believe that parenting is about us, it's not. It always was and should always be about our children. We have to tailor our parenting style to our child's personality, their developmental stage. And I mean, you can have two kids, but you'll have to parent them differently. At least I believe that. Uh, so to all the parents here, and I can see there are many out here, which is amazing. We are lucky because we have some eminent speakers all through this month at GTPS sharing their views and their insights and helping us become better parents each day. And I'm not gonna to take too much of anybody's time now. And I would move on to introduce our very first speaker. Our very first speaker is Sally Ann De La Casa. Sally Ann is one of the 4% of women globally who has a patent pending method and an algorithm for measuring soft skills. And she's the sole inventor. Sally Ann holds degrees and certification in law, organizational behavior and urban planning. She speaks five languages and is a published author. Her education spans the globe from Harvard University to Franklin College to the University of Toronto. Sally Ann spends her days obsessing over GLEAC, her technology company, which measures and develops soft skill gaps for any job, current or future. 
She's also the founder of the Growing Leaders Foundation. In partnership with the UNDP, thousands of at-risk youths and adults annually benefit from her foundation's work, delivering soft skills in the Caribbean, Latin American, and MENA region. She is currently based in Dubai, and her foundation has worked with many large companies. Sally Ann says that she's having the time of her life right now ensuring every human, regardless of their background or degree, and they will not have, they will have an equitable seat at the job table, but can also invite someone else. Sally Ann, please, uh, can we have you on now, please? Absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me um, here today. What a privilege um, to be here with all of you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Kumi, for inviting me. I appreciate it wholeheartedly. So I'm going to spend the next um, 15 minutes talking about some crucial issues and things I want you to kind of plant some seeds. Um, uh, and hopefully in your heart, in your head, uh, when it comes to parenting, when it comes to educating um, young people. Um, so first I'm gonna start, you see an image on here and I'm sure you're all wondering why, does, why do I have an image up there about the workplace of the future? And you know, fundamentally as parents, uh, from the time our child is born, we are already thinking about who they will become. <laughs> Um, and everything we do and everything that guides us in our choices that we make for them, we make with them, um, is about who we would like them to become in life. Uh, and I'm sure you've recognized some of the faces on here. You know, if I were to ask you and say to you as a parent, would, your, would you like your child to become like Satya Nudella, who is uh, the CEO of Microsoft, I'm sure many of you will go, absolutely, yes. Um, if I say to you, would you like your child to become uh, like uh, the new incoming um, uh, 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 Kamala Harris in the United States, you would say, absolutely, Vice President. And what about Indra Nuhi, um, the former uh, CEO of PepsiCo? I'm sure I'm getting some nods on here also, and Sundar Pichai. Um, so we all have a vision of who we would like our children to become. And there is this playlist many of us try to follow to have them become. And, and when we, you know, the becoming of our children, we're really kind of looking at three things, right? We're looking at, if I look at all of these, you know, uh, children, because these are somebody else's children right now, even though they're adults up there, there are three things um, that I know for a fact their parents wanted or you would want for whether you're a teacher or a parent for your child. One, um, I want you to be respected. So, you know, there's no doubt on here, everyone on here is respected. Number two, I want you to have financial freedom and success. There is no doubt that's what we're seeing um, when we rise to the top of whatever industry or field we're in. And the third thing is, I would like you to make a difference and impact in the world. And the reason I'm telling you those three things is because many times when we say, I want my child to be an engineer, I want my child to be a doctor, I want my child to be a lawyer, we are actually really saying those three things. I would like you to be respected. I would like you to have financial freedom and success. And I would like you to make a difference and impact in the world. It's just the vocabulary of how we say it comes out sometimes of you have to go to IIT or you have to go to Harvard um, or you have to get a degree. Um, uh, so today we're going to talk about you know, uh, my version of um, what, you know, um, respect, financial freedom, um, and success. Um, and the third one, um, to make a difference in the world. So this is, I'm going to call it the workplace of the future. Because if we're all doing our job really well as parents and educators, one day, whether it's 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, depending on how old your child is, we will put productive um, and um, uh, way better than we are human beings out there in the world um, in the future of the workplace. So I wanna give you some statistics really quickly for you to keep in mind. 
this is the World Economics Forum. They just released it um, in the last uh, two months. The 15 top skills that the world will need in 2025. And this is actually based on jobs and what are the skills they're looking for. Now, I'm going to just repeat a couple of them. Analytical thinking, active learning, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, leadership, resilience, reasoning. Did you notice on here? I don't know if you notice what's missing. You notice what's missing? Do you see on here um, uh, an IIT degree? My child must pass for science versus the arts. None of that is on here. Out of the top 10 skills, only two of them are what I would like to refer to, and we're going to talk about it, um, are functional hard skills. 80% of the top 10 are human skills like creativity, critical thinking, leadership, resilience. And I want you to really um, you know, sit back because most of us are, function are, are really focused on the hard skills, but that's not what the world needs right now. You know, I'm going to give you some more statistics I want you to think about parents. You know, according to the World Bank, all of us could be making 30% more than we're making right now if we had better human skills. In fact, according to Harvard, Stanford, and Carnegie Mellon, 85% of your job success or any person's job success comes from human skills, communication, collaboration, entrepreneurship, not the technical skills. So what does this mean in terms of parenting? And what does this mean when it comes to teaching? And what does this mean when it comes to the choices and where you should be focusing your energy in terms of educating a child and how you should be parenting? Um, you know, I, I, I hope I'm planting some seeds for you. So I want you to think about, you know, your child and going out into the world and every job in the world, and we don't know yet. So there is a statistic from Dell Technologies that says 85% of the jobs of 2030 has not been invented yet. So right now, if you have a child who is 10 years old or younger, you actually have no idea of what to prepare them for or what them prepare them for. Many of you who have university students, um, or if you are a university student right here, you're fortunate if by the time you graduate, your degree is going to be relevant to the job market and the world out there. So I want you to think about a job as an architecture when the walls are the hard skills and the space is all of these human skills. Um, and you know that's really, really important because so many times we do not focus. We think it's obvious. All of us know how to communicate. But I want you to think about that. How many people do you know communicates brilliantly? You might think all of us have emotional IQ. How many people know or you come across knows how to step into the shoes of someone else and really be empathetic? How many creative people do you know? Do you make part of your child's whether you're an educator or even for yourself, do you make creativity part of what you practice? Because learning requires practice. So it's many times the things that we're taking for granted and we should be focused on, whether it is through the education system or through parenting, we take it for granted. And those things are the things that are going to be the competitive differentiator in the world. Remember those four people I just showed you at the very beginning, Satya, Indra, Kamla, and Sundar? Well, why do you think they rose to the top? It is not because of their technical skills. So Satya actually failed his entry exam at IIT. I know most people are shocked by that. Um, Satya actually is known for his empathy. So those of us who we recognize who get to the top, it's always because of a human skill. Sundar, it's his diplomacy. Kamla, it's his her uh, visionary leadership. Indra Nuhi, it's her communication. And you can go and read any article about them or anyone that they lead, and they will actually point to those things. They do not point to the hard skills uh, when it comes to these uh, particular leaders. Um, so this is where I spend my time. Um, you know, so uh, my particular story in Gleek, G-L-E-A-C, 
is the technology um, that I invented. You know, I can proudly share with you that, um, uh, and I share it because it's a lot of hard work. I'm one of 4% of women in the world that invented an algorithm to measure human skills. So what does that mean? And I'll kind of tell you what that means. So I can tell you any job, and this is available to you. And that's why I'm sharing it to you. Because a lot of times when we talk about these human skills for parents and educators, they're like, well, it's very soft. Like, how do I know? How do I have my child practice that? How do I practice it myself as an adult? You know, 50% of adults right now. So all of you watching needs to get upskilled, needs to because the world is just changing so quickly. So this is also applicable to all of us, including myself. So again, think of any job and think of the architecture, hard skills and human skills. We're able to tell you what the human skills are and we're able to drop you into situations of those human skills and have you practice it. And this is what my algorithm um, is based on. And this is something that I'm really passionate about as um, an educator because I'm fundamentally um, a teacher. Uh, uh, even though I have all kinds of technical hard skill degrees, um, even from Harvard, but I, what my, what has caused me to rise in the world is my human skills. Um, so uh, please have a look at that. You know, I just said to you, fifty percent of all of us need um, uh, upskilling, and that's going to keep happening. So, you know, what has happened to the world is when you graduated or your parents graduated from college and university, um, the value of a degree was a thirty-year career or a fifteen-year career. Uh, the value of a degree today is, as I said to you, maybe you're lucky, it has value when you graduate. Um, many American institutions and schools are moving away from four-year degrees and going into tiny micro-credentialing just because the world is changing so quickly and jobs are merging and emerging so quickly. Let me give you an example. You know, if today you thought your child is really good with numbers and they might be an accountant, well, accountants make the best cybercrime analysts. An accountant makes about 30,000 US dollars a year starting out. A cybercrime analyst starting out makes 80,000. What would you choose? You know, if we go back to that core fundamental respect, financial freedom, um, and making impact in the world. So you see how jobs are um, emerging and changing. This is the Udemy report. It just came out this week of um, over the last uh, 2020, the last 12 months, um, uh, and in uh, 2020, uh, 2019 with WHO, uh, WHO, they recognized what are the, where is everyone spending their time on Udemy, uh, which is one of the largest platforms, and what skills are they learning? And I want you to notice on here, it's not data science, it's not software development, it's all human skills. So this one is on time management, mo motivation, self-discipline, um, mental health issues, um, stress management, meditation, mindfulness, um, uh, communication skills, listening, business communication, business writing, um, conflict management. So it's all happening, everything right now in the human skills space. I want you to, you know, this is this looks like many of our grannies, um, or sometimes some of us, even our moms in the room. And I, I and the reason there's a reason why I showed you, um, you know, this version of granny for me. Um, the number one job in the United States um, in April of 2020 was a job for a role called contact tracer. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Last year, this time, none of us even knew that role existed. Uh, with COVID, that role, there was a hundred thousand positions available for that rule just in April. That rule pays between 17 to 34 US dollars per hour. There is no degree for that rule. There's no course for you to take. My company actually designed one of the benchmarks to actually in 10 minutes, we can tell whether you are you're, you're um, equipped for that rule or not. And it required three things. And guess where were those three things? It required curiosity and novelty seeking. It required rule following. Um, and it required, you know, um, uh, good self-direction. Those are all human skills. And guess who has those human skills in spades? That's right, grannies. Um, so this rule, and when you think about what I just told you in terms of the value, you know, 17 to 34 US dollars an hour, that's more than a software engineer. First three years graduating out of any, you know, school in India makes. 
And someone who's over 60 or over 70 um, can go up and be making that in 10 minutes by taking a simple benchmark um, and qualify for that role. So that's the world your children, whether you're an educator or a parent um, or yourself, you know, you are also um, going after that same job as your child because human skills is the differentiator, right? So it doesn't matter what your background is or where you got educated. So I want you to keep that in mind in terms of um, educating your children. Um, uh, I will end, it's my last 20 seconds by saying, please go on our um, website. Um, you can try out for free many of the benchmarks. And I am putting a link in the chat, um, you know, giving all of you some free mindfulness lessons and to practice your human skills. So please enjoy doing that. And um, I want to just say the workplace of the future is human. So that means parenting and teaching of the future, if you're going to make uh, um, uh, humans who are ready for the future needs to be human also. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Sally Ann. That was amazing. Thank you for reminding us that parents don't have to live through their children and you know don't have to force their dreams sometimes we forget that you know and and thank you also for reminding us that it's not about the IIT and IIMs it's about the human skills and um, well I, I grew up uh, doing art and I did advertising and now I run a community for mothers and there was no course to learn that and there was you know there was no qualification to do that and I've been doing it over 10 years uh, and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. So thank you so much for your lovely words. I, I'm sure we have a lot to think about and take back home. Uh, with that, I'm going to move to our next speaker, who is uh, Mrs. Sujata Sriram. Welcome, Sujata. Sujata is a professor at the School of Human Ecology uh, at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. She was the former Dean of the School of Human Ecology. She was awarded the Fulbright Nehru Senior Research Fellowship 2010-11 at the, at the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, San Diego, and has been in the field of higher education for over three decades. Before her stint at TIS, she taught at the Delhi University. In TIS, she was part of the team that set up iCall, the psychosocial helpline that offers counseling services over telephone and email. Sujata enjoys teaching and research she is eternally curious and enjoys trying to find what makes people tick. Sujata teaches courses in psychology, research methods, and human development for the MA Applied Psychology students at TIS. She works in the area of families, childcare, parenting, and of course, marriage, divorce, and also family socialization in the context of globalization. She works also about uh, through uh, mental health, psychological counseling, well-being, social media and its impact, happiness and well-being, identity, religion, and spirituality. Welcome, Sujata. I think we have a lot to hear from you. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Ruchita. I think uh, uh, it's kind of difficult for somebody to follow on, uh, you know, after Sally Ann. I think she's been uh, extremely illuminating in terms of the kinds of things that she's told you. I think she's set the stage for me. Uh, in many ways, she's made it actually more difficult for me because uh, I think some of the uh, key words that she was also talking about were some of the things I wanted to say. Anyway, too bad. So I've called my piece Musings on Parenting. And uh, again, it's essentially I'm trying not to sermonize. I may end up sermonizing. I'm sorry about that. But essentially, when we think about parent parenting, you know, uh, it's a job for which there's no training that's been given. And as parents, we're generally thrown in the deep end and expected to be good parents, if not at least effective parents. And as parents, all of us want to do our best for our children, often providing opportunities that we never had as children. Okay, and what and some of the things that we ourselves aspire for. These aspirational ideals in parenting can take up a lot of energy and time. And again, let's also remember that parenting as I see it, is a stressful job at the best of times. And the pandemic right now hasn't made things any easier. Let's also remember that our parents serve as the role models for our parenting. And this includes all the things that you promised yourself that you would never do when you had children. But these are invariably the scripts that are very easy to fall back on. 
it's very easy again to tell parents about what to do to improve their parenting. And I think this is something that international NGOs do very often. Okay, uh, I think you know NGOs like uh, UNICEF do it all the time. Okay, and uh, I have a problem with that very often because many of these uh, agencies forget that very often parents are trying to do their best for their children and often with very limited resources. Again, the number of self-ascribed parenting experts that are available today are plentiful. Now, all ready to tell us about all the best ways to bring up our children. And now it's my turn to do the same. Okay, so I'm gonna try not to pontificate, but if I do, I've been given the platform. So let me seize it, carpe diem as they say. So as parents, when we interact with our children, I'd say that there are some things that we should keep in mind. And I think the first word that would come to mind is would be consistency. I would request all parents to try and ensure that there is consistency in the messages to their children. And this includes consistency between parents. I'd say children are extremely capable to pick up when parents are out of sync with each other. And they're very adept at using this asynchrony to their advantage. In the interest of harmonious parenting, it would help if consistent messages are given by parents. In an ideal world, don't iron out your disagreements in the presence of either your offspring or your parents. As parents, if you can be respectful to each other in the presence of your children, you're conveying a great message. Try and speak well of your partner to your child. However tempting it is to sigh, make an eye roll, show impatience, it may be way better to desist from doing the same, along with avoiding the complaints. Again, try and communicate directly with each other, rather than use your children as conduits for passing a message. What's referred to as switchboard communication, it never really works. And again, let's also remember that consistency needs to extend into daily routines. It would help immensely to set up daily routines which can be followed. These don't have to be cast in stone, but they can be adapted depending on the occasion, the day, the time. If the routine includes the following elements, that's for me, eating, bath, teeth, story, bed, you can add elements to this list, school, homework, me time, play. For me, routines are especially useful for children who crave stability and predictability. And as children grow older, these routines can be adapted very collaboratively. Again, many of the problem behaviors that parents complain about can stem from not setting up or following routine. Again, as parents, it's very easy to assume that what I don't like, my child isn't going to like either. As far as I'm concerned, children need to be given the space to make up their mind about likes and dislikes without adults telling them what they should like and why. And we need to listen to what they're saying without jumping to conclusions. It's tempting to tell stories about your children to others in their presence, but this invariably makes them feel self-conscious, which may not be the best thing. If you do want to talk about your child, try not to do that when they're around, do that when they're not around. And this includes criticism and praise. Most Indian children find it much easier to criticize their child. The praise always needs to come from someone else. If only we could learn to praise our children in their hearing and for things that you accept as good. Another example of consistency. Additionally, it's very easy to be dismissive of childish fantasies. But childhood, shown a fantasy, would be drab, dull, monotonous, which is anyway what adult life is like in most cases. So why deprive children of some amount of fantasy life? And very often, if you're lucky, you may end up living your fantasy, which is also not a bad thing ever. I would also like to say that, you know, there is an adult world out there that children need to be aware of 
But they also need to be aware that they're not a part of this. You know, the recognition that a grown-up world is not really their business is something that helps childhood linger for longer. And why deprive children of childhood earlier than necessary? This is something that, you know, being aware of the grown-up world is something that's necessary in the larger scheme of things. They can ask questions about it. But as adults, you don't really need to answer them or don't, you don't need to answer them directly. As parents, one of the things that we need to do is also establish family rules. And these family rules also helps a lot in maintaining order. Family rules can be revisited over time. Some of the things that could come in when we're looking at family rules relate also with things like no name calling, no violence. Being able to listen without interrupting, for me, that's a very important thing. You know, we keep talking about being able to communicate, but unfortunately, as a human race, I think we've forgotten how to listen. We tend to interrupt a lot. And I think that's one of the skills that we also need to develop in our children. This list can be added depending on what's important for our families. I think for individual families, we need to develop these lists, these family rules, and family rules are important. One of the things that comes up for me a lot these days is, you know, the need that families have to keep children constantly busy. You know, mothers and fathers feel the need to constantly play with their children, to teach them, to keep them busy. And very often parents take on all these extra obligations because someone has convinced them that these are essential for optimizing a child. But what we don't realize is that with too much instruction, children miss out. And what do they miss out on? They miss out on the opportunity to learn how to learn through self-exploration and observation. The ability to learn through self-exploration helps children adapt to challenges at school and later in life. I would say children are built for autonomous learning. They are born knowing how to create their own to toys, to design their own games, and to settle their own arguments. They need surprisingly little interference from adults. Children have spent their days learning this way for thousands of years. I would also like to talk about schools and families. Schools and families form a very uneasy alliance. There is little synchrony between both these very vital systems that children are involved in. You know, and these are you know, systems in which children spend a lot of time in their lives. There are multiple aspects that parents would like to hand over to schools to do. And at the same time, there are multiple things that schools wish that parents would do more of. At some level, there needs to be much more dialogue between schools and families. And at the end of the day, this dialogue is what would help schools and families, and at the end of the day, children, much more. I would like to end with a quote from Khalil Gibran from a book called The Prophet, a book published in 1923. Uh, this was actually in response to a young mother who asked for advice on children and parenting. And I think this sums up a lot of what we're talking about today. And I think for the rest of this summit, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children, as living arrows, are sent forth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sajata. That was lovely. Um, I don't know everybody else, but I think I've taken two things from your session, which is about the children don't really listen to us, but they are watching us. 
So I think it's important what we do. And uh, the other thing is, I, I, it reminded me of Pink Floyd's song, Another Brick in the Wall, where it says, leave the kids alone. So <laughs> we, as parents, we should practice a little more of that. Uh, thank you so much. And before I move on to our third speaker, everybody here, please do send in our questions. We're getting some lovely questions for the speakers, which I will ask them uh, later. But uh, if there is anything that you want to ask them, please do share and uh, we'll make sure that uh, we get, we ask our speakers. And now I move on to Mr. R. Sridhar, who's an innovation facilitator, coach, author, and speaker. Mr. Sridhar has worked in Ogilvy and Mather I agency for, he worked for over 25 years in India where he was a board director. He worked in their Chennai, Bangalore, and Mumbai offices. He set up the Ogilvy's fifth office in Bangalore and he's also known for his pioneering work in direct marketing in India. In 2000, he stepped out to set up his own innovation practice. He acquired his coaching certification from the Coaching Foundation of India and has been practicing as an executive coach since 2010. His mission is to help people think different and do better. Mr. Sridhar has had a long career as an advertising professional, innovation facilitator, and executive coach. He has facilitated over 400 ideation workshops for clients, helping them solve problems and seize new opportunities. His work is like a software for the mind. He has collaborated with leaders across all functions. He's a much sought after speaker on the subject ideas, creativity and innovation, and author of the book, Unlock the Real Power of Ideation. As an individual, he thrives in learning new things and working with new people. He derives the greatest satisfaction when he has been able to make a difference and enable an individual or a team reach his, their creative potential. His current challenge is to help people think better through his online talks, webinars, and workshops and unlock their creative potential. Welcome, Mr. Sridhar. We are waiting to unlock ours. Okay. Thank you so much. I need some help to uh, get my presentation on there. <clears throat> That's right. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm talking about something and saying why we should not drive looking at the rear view mirror. <clears throat> why did I think of this subject is because, <clears throat> sorry, I've been talking to a lot of parents and grandparents. I am a grandparent now. I think one of the things that most of us do is that we're constantly looking at where we came from and what we did in the past and how things worked for us and somehow apply that as some set of principles and formulae to guide our children to move forward. <clears throat> and I think, <clears throat> sorry, I think there is a major problem and flaw in that kind of thinking. So my talk is about how parents can relook at this entire way of looking at bringing up children. The next slide, please. <clears throat> May I have the next slide? Yeah. So I am a grandfather out of touch with parenting. <clears throat> if you're a grandfather, I think grandparenting is a very different ball game from that of parenting. So I sought some help. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what I learned from the conversation with Pavitra, <clears throat> so I'm so sorry about this, are some of these things as follows. Next slide. First is to say is that stay in touch with the kid no matter what. Now, this is like uh, uh, an altruistic statement. Now. But this is a tough one to see, which is when you say stay in touch, it is not like supervision. It's about staying in touch with what the kid is doing, staying in touch with what the kid is saying, staying in touch with what is bothering the kid and what is the kid anxious about, stay in touch with what is the kid's aspiration and what is bothering the kid, what is making him happy, or what, what is making the child tick and so on and so forth. So this kind of staying in touch with the kid is an extremely important thing in terms of parenting roles uh, today. And I've seen uh, not just Pavitra, but several moms do that very effectively in terms of staying in touch, staying in touch with the moods, staying in with the, their anxieties, aspirations, and so on. So this is one very important thing that I learned from our conversation. The next one. Be aware of how she or she, he or she spends time, where, with whom, and when and without snooping. Now, the moment you start snooping, you lose the trust. But is there a way in which you can find out this information? Is there a way in which you can have a healthy conversation with the child to say, 
So what was your day like? And what did you do? What made you happy today? Who were you with? Who did you have lunch with today? What did that kid bring? What did you take today? Right? What, what he took today that must be known to the mother, but then she will also find out what else he took from the uh, uh, you know, pantry, like uh, some biscuits or cookies and so on and so forth. So this conversation, understanding where the kid is spending time will let us know what the kid's priorities are, who his friends are, what kind of people are those uh, uh, kids, where are they coming from, what kind of families. This gives us an excellent insight into the way the kid thinks, talks, and behaves. Okay, the next slide. Encourage questions from the children. A lot of people don't like uncomfortable questions. Especially, they don't want disagreements, right? And they don't want uncomfortable conversations. When the kid is actually questioning you, not asking questions, he's saying, you're asking me to do this, but you're not doing it. Why is that, right? So uh, you're asking me to do it, but grandpa is not doing that. Why is that, fine? So if you're actually ducking these questions and ducking uncomfortable conversations, there are issues that will come. Now, in the old days, you know, my father would have said, listen, enough is enough, you go ahead and do that. But today, I think that's not on. It's not likely to be working. So there is a way in which you need to encourage questions. Teach the children how to ask questions. You know, for instance, there is a formula called 5W1H in the business of asking questions. If you ask, who, what, when, and where, you get specific answers, right? Why expands the scope of the discussion? How expands the scope of discussions? Teach the children how to ask clear questions so that they get the right answers. You ask the right questions, you get the right answers. So one of the other things that is extremely important in this encouraging questions is your tone and style of the questions, okay? If your tone and style is even, that is one thing. If the tone and style is commanding and threatening, then the child is actually going to actually clam up and it's going to open, it's not going to open and say anything at all. So certainly encourage questions, encourage disagreements, um, allow uncomfortable conversations. Next. Understand that his or high likes and dislikes need not match your likes and dislikes. Most parents, uh, I mean, I, I have been guilty of that, but uh, I understood how to get out of that. I, I like a certain kind of food. My child may not like it, and it's absolutely fine, right? So I think one of the things that the taste that develop is also a function of what we are exposed to outside the home. My child is going out to meet a whole lot of her friends. The kind of institution she goes to is completely different to the kind of institution I went to. My friends are very different from her friends. Okay, the language they speak is very different and so on and so forth. So I have to understand, appreciate, and actually be willing to embrace some of this in terms of this is what she likes and this is what she dislikes. And that's perfectly all right for her to have a point of view on what she likes or dislikes. Okay, next slide. Demonstrate willingness to do things that matter to the child. For example, getting a dog for the kid, though you may hate dogs. I grew up in a small flat in Mumbai opposite the Shanmukhananda Hall, you know, one room kitchen kind of flat. My daughter lives in a place in Seattle, which is big. And then recently, uh, one of the kids wanted a dog. And after much debate, they said, okay, you want a dog, have a dog. And the dog is at home now. Okay. So part of the family, if you saw the picture, there is a dog there. He's called Hobbes, that Calvin and Hobbes kind of stuff. And it's very much part of the family. And there is, every time we call her and speak to her, as much as we are talking to them about them and the kids, we talk about the dog as well, right? So demonstrate willingness to do things that matter to the child that you may not have done, you may not have considered, which may not have been part of your way of growing up, but that doesn't make any difference. As long as you demonstrate willingness to do things that matter to the child, the child is going to respond to you when, she understands or he understands what matters to you. Next. Go the extra mile. The mother researches about how to grow plants and buys a few pots to encourage her daughter's interest in gardening. In this case, the daughter in question is just five years old. Okay, our granddaughter. 
now she understands and she is talking constantly about wanting to go to plants and so on and so forth so they have gone and got a small pots and every day she water the plant every day she goes and checks every day there is a conversation where she says oh this is happening mommy and then when she comes on uh, the, the uh, whatsapp call with us and they, they she tells us i can see uh, the amount of excitement that is there and the and the uh let's say the the happiness in the conversation the healthy nature of the conversation so go that extra mile seems like a cliche but that extra mile is not miles and miles of miles extra mile is a little bit five steps six steps what i mean 10 steps ahead kind of stuff but this is it the moment the child sees you take the initiative and do something that you may not have normally done instinctively they respond so that's the that's the name of the game go the extra mile next one next slide now parents give up using all leather products to honor their daughter's concern for cruelty to animals okay now here uh, pavitra our daughter is alluding to what my my wife and i did years ago pavitra is a, a animal activist kind of person and then uh, she she had a lot of problems because i was wearing leather belts i was wearing a uh, leather strap for my uh, watch and i was wearing leather shoes and so on and so forth and uh, we understood how deeply it meant for her so i gave up wearing leather belts i gave up wearing leather uh, leather straps for my watch uh, shoes unfortunately we are not able to get away with it but by and large the signal that we sent to her saying if it matters to you it matters to us if it concerns you if it bothers you it bothers us we are in it together kind of thing and uh, after so many years she is the mother of three kids she is uh, i think crossed 40 now and she's this thing is still staying with her because we respected her view children would like to be respected for their points of view they may not state it in so many words they will not use the word respect but automatically instinctively they respond when you respect and i think that respect is is a very very important thing we need to show to our children next find at least one activity where the family can get together this is a very interesting thing now when i was growing up uh one activity where my father myself i have an elder brother and an elder sister they used to when they were studying in college and the three of us would go to holidays together and to places that all of us liked and all five of us liked at certain things and then my father found some way of making sure that all five of us went together now this is same thing i i see that my daughter is also doing together and the activity is something where all the five children have a say in the matter right and therefore if it is swimming then uh, you know two out of three might like it if it is a particular restaurant something and something but activities where all of them are together so this is a very important thing that the parenting should actually or the parents should consider because if you really believe that the family as a unit is a very important thing to is to keep together then we, we must figure out things to do together i think that's a very interesting suggestion for a lovely idea next slide this is very important um, enjoy their joy train yourself to do it I mean, in terms of taste, for instance, I mean, I I had never tasted a pizza in my life till our daughter came into our lives, okay. And then, if she says, "I would like to have this for lunch or I have that for dinner," and we have not tasted it, we were willing to taste it. And she knew that I'm a strict vegetarian. My wife is a strict vegetarian, and she is a strict vegetarian. And she will always suggest things which are vegetarian. but then which is something not part of our regular cuisine regular uh, menu and so on and so forth so and then similarly the kind of holidays that she wanted she wanted to go on a cruise we never been on a cruise right so we said we'll go on a cruise so the moment we demonstrated that we are enjoying what matters to her we enjoy their joy and then we have trained ourselves to do that the kind of reciprocation you get from kids is indescribable there are no words to describe it and it's so fulfilling right and it fills your heart with joy because a child is happy and that's what matters to us most next slide find one physical activity to do together okay now 
if it is playing a game then try to play a game if it is football if it's call soccer whatever it is now i mean you might like walking but the kid is not going to like walking fine so we have to figure out a way i'm going to amusement amusement parks together could be another kind of stuff but one thing that we found out is that the moment you care enough to find what matters to them they find a way to care for us and care for our interests and it becomes reciprocal and there are times i have seen that it, uh, when we go there for a vacation one of the kids will come and say hey tatu you like this right i just brought this for you I mean i didn't ask for it but then the fact that you actually showed that concern and care for the kid shows them that this is a good thing to do and without having to advise them lecture to them they actually reciprocate okay find one physical activity to do together it it actually brings the family together next slide okay this is a be a yay sayer not a nay sayer be positive so it it's it's also the language we speak actually comes through from tone and style the, you know there is a very interesting uh, research that was done in terms of how how do people receive communication 50% 57% of what we say is coming from our body language and tone and style only about 7% is based on words so if i am positive if i am constantly in a frame of mind in a in a way in which i am saying encouraging things even when i'm negating or actually saying no to the kid is there a way in which i can say it where the kid actually feels good about it that rather than you know dismissive being dismissive about it so be a yay say or be a cheerleader and not a naysayer be positive next slide <laughs> this is very interesting don't be their baggage be the trolley right now baggage could be psychological baggage it need not be a physical baggage psychological baggage is you know very often we say and do things that can embarrass them in in front of their people people their friends and so on and so forth so if you take the trouble let's say for instance uh, we are on a visit there and uh, they call people over for dinner then i should take the trouble to check out who is going to come for dinner tell me a little more about these people and i spend a little bit of time understanding them and then saying okay so with this person i can have this kind of conversation and so on and so forth so you actually uh, participate in what is being done what they are doing and they are also calling people over for dinner because they want them to meet us so th this is the point is there a way in which i can flow with the entire flow of things and the and the scheme of things rather than being sticking around like a so thumb so don't be their baggage be their trolley a lovely way to say it this is my daughter saying okay not mine next respect their dreams don't be little them don't laugh because he wants to be a comedian laugh at his jokes instead very often what happens is that um, the dream could be completely different from what we've been used to i come up i come from a family where nobody was in advertising okay my father was an engineer my brother was an engineer my sister my eldest sister was a home science specialist and the only guy who stepped out and i uh, got a job with a agency called frank simois advertising years ago and that is the first uh, advertising job and the, the the honest truth is i didn't join frank simois because of advertising because he was a guy who was willing to pay me the salary which i wanted at that time and then i stuck around okay so the point is that if you are and then my dream became that i need to become somebody in the field of advertising and so on and so forth so when you respect their dreams and don't laugh at them they actually become so comfortable with things that you are saying to them when it is important for them so it is a very reciprocal way of understanding feelings emotions dreams aspirations what bothers them when you do that when they are in their worst mode and something is upset they'll come and freely tell you irrespective of your age because they trust you right and we have to earn the trust and keep them this is where respecting their dreams and not belittling them is by body language telling them i'm there for you i'm there with you i'm there with all the time to do what you make sense what makes sense for you and what's important for you next slide so this is another suggestion which i do and so does my daughter try journaling as a parent 
try out thoughts write out thoughts dreams aspirations fears concerns frustrations right and doesn't have to take too much time you know snatch at least 10 minutes every day to do it no excuses it doesn't really take that much time all you need to do is you choose a perfect time for you to uh, do your journaling for instance i am an early morning person i write my journal in the morning so when i write the journal it talks about what happened yesterday or day before if you're a late evening person you can talk about what happened that day and what you plan to do next day but somehow when you write it something is happening some magic is happening to the brain some magic is happening to the emotion some magic is happening to the way things are settling down let us say that you are upset with somebody or something and then you actually write it out and suddenly you feel much lighter right so journaling as a parent in terms of what upset you what delighted you what excites you what you find it exasperating when you actually let all that out onto the journal then you don't have to let it out you will not let it out on the kid and that makes a huge difference to parenting the quality of parenting and the quality of parenting that the kid receives from you okay next the magic is to be present in the moment when you're with the child don't worry about anything else if you don't the child will sense it a distracted parent sends out all the wrong signals if if you're not listening and you're nodding your head the child will immediately find out you're not interested and she'll go away and strangely they don't forget it they don't come back later if they are on to that kind of stuff so the moment you are saying that look i'm like a blotting paper i'm going to absorb everything you're saying and doing they will want to spend more time with you and make makes a huge difference and the only way to do it is to understand how to stay with the moment right so if i have priorities then i can tell the child hey give me a few minutes let me finish and i'll come back to you right they accept it but once you're with them you have to be with them if he is building lego then he builds lego he paints he paints but you with them your mind is not on anything else you will not look at the mobile when you are sitting with them right they will actually take and keep it away but allow that to be happen so i am saying the magic is to be present in the moment when you are with a child don't worry about anything else don't do anything else <coughs> next one finally listen to their dreams let them build their castles in the air as a parent help them put the foundation to the uh, to build that castle when that's the role build the foundation if today you found build the foundation with you or not with, with you not there being around for them they will be able to build the castles our job is to help build the foundation they will build their castles on their own okay so this is my bit in terms of understanding parenting i started by saying why we need not or should not look at uh where we came from you know and therefore look at the today and the tomorrow uh because their lives are about today's and tomorrow's and if you want to really help stay with their today's and tomorrow's and be with them right through and then uh be be the subject of their gratitude that be the subject of their happiness right thank you very much for this opportunity kumi delighted to be with you and everybody today thank you so much mr shridhar i think they were uh, you know these were really simple points but so relevant and i think as parents we forget them i especially love the part where you said don't be their baggage but their trolley uh, and uh, while I, and I, as a parent of a teenager i love the fact of keeping in touch with them but not snooping so i'm going to practice a little bit of that uh, though i don't know uh, my children are also wanting to get a dog i'm not too sure whether i'm going to get a dog very soon but uh, we'll keep that in mind so uh, thank you everybody but we've got some amazing amazing questions uh, from our participants and i'm going to ask uh, starting with sally ann sally ann uh, i hope you're there sally ann okay let me uh, let me start with uh, sujatha ma'am right now since i can see her sujatha ma'am can you unmute yourself sure thank you yeah so uh, ma'am there's a question where somebody has asked you that when you talk of family rules these are normally laid down by senior members of the family how would you advocate fair laying down of family rules 
No, I think I said that, you know, family rules uh, need, can be very collaboratively done like family routines. And I think, uh, you know, the thing about rules is that uh, parents need to recognize that rules change as children grow older. And I think very often the problems that come up, you know, you can't use the same rule with an eight-year-old as you would use with a 14-year-old. Okay, yeah. you are headed for trouble if you try that. What works with an eight-year-old isn't going to work with a 14-year-old. There are different, uh, you know, uh, uh, liberties that a 14-year-old would want to take with you. And uh, you need to be able to uh, accept that. And I think rules are there for a reason. Yeah. All of us actually, uh, you know, we have rules and we tend to follow rules because of the fact that that's what leads to a orderly organized life. And all said and done, I think uh, a simple rule could be on the dining table, no telephones, no mobile phones. We don't uh, watch television while having dinner. Everybody comes and has dinner at the same time. Those are simple rules. I'm not talking about any exotic, esoteric kinds of rules. I'm talking about basic things that are important for keeping family life going. Great. And these can Thank be you. very collaboratively <clears throat> formed. Can I add a very uh, interesting statement which I read some time ago? It said, rules are, the, are for the obedience of fools and the guidance of wise men. <laughs> Sujata ma'am, I have another question for you. Uh, they want to know, how can we have a dialogue with teachers and school management when they operate from a rigid mindset and think that they have a superior understanding of children than us? Uh, actually, that's a big problem that comes up in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the way schools function. And I think uh, that's where uh, effective parent-teacher association really helps in terms of getting, uh, you know, schools to understand the mindset from which parents come. And that's the way in which I think that bridging has to come forward at some point. And right now, schools function with the attitude that they are, uh, again, unfortunately, they are the, uh, uh, they provide a scarce supply, okay? And we all want to run towards certain schools. I think we also need, as families, as parents, we need to look beyond those schools. You know, why, why is it that we're all running after, you know, those top five schools? What is it that those top five schools are providing? And again, if you're going to end up with your child being one of 60 in a class, you know, there's not really going to get much individual attention. So what are you, you know, pining for getting into this number one school for? And I don't know whether families are looking enough into what schools provide for families, for children. You know, we look at, okay, all the extracurricular activities that are provided, okay? We look at all the number of children who get into IIT. But I think there's a lot more that is there in schools rather than, you know, just looking at, uh, you know, whether they're going to get into IIT or IIM or whatever. I think there is a lot that comes up in terms of what is the kind of, what are the kinds of values that your children are going to leave school with? I mean, if you're going to go to a school where your children are, send your children to a school where they're going to be stressed out and, you know, they're going to be burnt out by the time they get into college. I don't think uh, that's the right place to send your kids. Great. Thank you so much. And um, I have a question for Mr. Sridhar now. Mr. Sridhar, someone wants to know that some children are like closed oysters and refuse to talk. How can we get to know them? Can you say that again, please? I said some children are like closed oysters and refuse to talk. So how can we get to know them? Okay, I think the most important word is encouragement. Okay, now if we observe the child, there are certain things, now they may not speak, but there are things that they do. And if I, if I keep five things on the table, which is of interest to children, I'll say pick one of those, right? And she will pick it. So suppose she doesn't pick any one of them, then I'll say, uh, uh, you, you don't like this, is it? Can you tell me why you don't like this? And she'll say something. What I'm really doing there is that I'm actually engaging, trying to engage that kid in a conversation. I'm 
communicating to her through my body language and interest that I am interested in what she is saying. I am keen to know what her opinion is, right? So I think that body language and tone and style makes a lot of difference and brings a lot of comfort to the child. And I've seen this happen with our own daughter. I've seen it happening with our grandchildren. So I am saying it on on the basis of experience. Okay. And then uh, there is a style that I adopt as as a grandparent. There is a style my wife adopts. So we, we the two of us are completely different. We are, our sun signs are completely different. I am an Aries and she is a Libra. Okay. You can see how it works. Yeah. But the point is that if you're really keen to help, I am saying if one way does not work, try another way. If the second way does not work, try a third way. Don't give up. And it works. If I can come in on that, I think uh, you know uh, that's one of the problems that uh, I think increasingly we're getting into. In uh, we're trying to. Go too fast in many parts of yeah. the country today, right. Right. and uh, we don't uh, spend enough time in terms of allowing individual children to really flower or flourish. Very true. There's a lot that we do in terms of you know getting children to speak, you know, to demonstrate, to uh, you know, to perform, and not all children want to perform. Can we allow children to grow according to their space, according to what is important for them? Again, you know, uh, I'm going to use two words here: that is introversion and extroversion. Okay. Uh, we as a society do not allow introverts to develop on their own. We want all children to be. Extrovert. Right, right. Again, the fortunate thing is maybe eighty percent of the kids are extrovert. Okay, but the twenty percent who are not, they're the ones who have the toughest yeah. job. And why don't you speak? Right. <laughs> why don't you perform the when the teacher asks you why aren't you out there? Correct. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, yeah, I, I think really... another angle to that, which is which is very important. What she said is that. Um, This whole business about mathematics, right? Uh, I am not good in mathematics. Used to be my child's problem, and we told her that it doesn't matter. Okay, there are many things we can do even if you thought mathematics. Now it may be true, not maybe true, but the fact that we are willing to accept that she was weak in mathematics actually made her put in more effort, and she actually became good at it. But if we had put pressure, I think it would have actually become a big problem, right? So we found her a tutor who was a family friend, and she was interested in my daughter as a person rather than as a tuition student, right? And that made a huge difference. So I, I think it's very important saying we don't put them under pressure because of the normal things that society says. Uh, yes, if I, I may just say something here, uh, these are brilliant insights, and I think uh, the audience is thoroughly enjoying the conversation. Uh, Sally Ann, for some reason, logged out, but she's in again. So, Ruchita, this is only to inform you she's back here. Yeah. Oh, great! Thank you, Thank you very yeah. much. That's nice. Okay. Uh, welcome back, Sally Ann. I'm going to ask my last question to Mr. Shridhar, uh, yeah. and uh, even Sujata can step in. So there's a question which says, very often parents indulge their children with whatever they want. How do you say no without making it sound like you're disagreeing with them? Say that again. Say that again. Your voice is breaking. Very sorry. Very often parents indulge their children with whatever they want. You know, they give in to everything that their children want, and yeah. then how? How do you say no without making it sound like you're disagreeing with them? Okay, so there are. I think uh, saying no is the shortest way, right? And then that's a big lazy we indulge in no. Yeah. So suppose I'll say that look, okay, let's go to the shop. We'll buy it. And what will you do? Suppose it was not available in the shop. What do you think we should do? Right. Instead of that, would you want to look at something else? or if it is not available today can we look at it tomorrow suppose it's not at all available it is completely out do you want to try something else but tell me why is it important for you have it right now this takes time right and parents are busy with their own stuff they are watching their television show i mean if i have to speak to this child this conversation will take me 20 25 minutes and the whole episode will be gone right <laughs> so this is the problem so what am i willing to give up 
because I, this child is important. What she says is important. And if she says, I want this, then I want to say, okay, if you get it, what do you think you will do with it? Suppose that is not available. What do you think we can use instead of that? Right now, sir, I'm actually introducing ways and means of the child to look at alternatives as well without pontificating. But for me to do that, I must have the patience. I must actually remove my cap as an adult. And there is, we have to use empathy. I know a lot of people use the word empathy, right? Uh, empathy, they say, is that you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. But the first operating condition is you have to get out of your own shoes to be able to get onto the other person's shoes, right? So if I have to do that, I have to actually get out of my shoes. I have to feel for her the way she feels. If I don't feel for her the way she feels, she instinctively finds out that I'm actually, you know, acting. And that's the worst thing that can happen to her. And the transparency thing will be hurt for life. Thank you, sir. Um, Sally Ann, uh, if you can hear me, um, I'd like you. Uh, you. Uh, yes. Hi, Sally Ann. Welcome back. Um, so there's a question for you, which says, how can we convince our spouses and extended families that we should concentrate as much on soft skills as on degrees? Do you have courses for families? Yes. So um, thank you for that question. Um, there's one thing I want to answer. There's a question um, in the chat um, and I, I'm going to, uh, you know, I really would like to address it about um, a mother going, my son is an introvert. He speaks in class, but is mo mostly reluctant to extended families. And I just wanted to um, address the issue about many times we misunderstand what introvert and extrovert means. An introvert just means that I get my energy from spending time with myself. An extrovert means I get my energy off of being around other people. What happens a lot of times, you know, in reference to this, and I, I do have to tell you this, I'm an introvert, and but I'm not shy. So a lot of times we mix up and we call our child an introvert when they might just be shy, right? That's a whole other issue, or many times, um, uh, introverts or thinkers. Introverts, I have to tell you, as being one myself, um, uh, a lot of times they're the quietest person in the room, but when they do speak, when they become adults, everybody listens because yeah. they've been thinking through things. Right. Um, and some of the most brilliant people, most of the most brilliant people in the world are introverted. So for every parent on here who is kind of looking through that chat of going, my child is an introvert and something might be wrong with them. You know, as a parent, we want our children to be social and have friends and all of those things. But your child might just be this brilliant thinker in the making um, and allow them and give them the space um, to be that, right? They don't have to be talking all the time and be with people all the time and be with friends all the time. And just because your, your friend's kids look and sound that way. Um, so I just want to make sure I address that because um, uh, 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 that's something that's really important. In reference to family members and um, courses, so absolutely. Um, uh, uh, we provide, you know, there's a, there's a, a youth side of Gleek and there's the adult side of Gleek. And, you know, we have the actual measure for it. And even for you guys as parents or teachers, we have the only continuing professional development certification out of the UK for parents and teachers and anyone to go through the soft human skills and discuss it as a family. So you can actually say, as a family, we're going to work on um, communication this month, or we're going to work on leadership this month, or we're going to look work on judgment and decision making, and you get these tiny little micro practices, they're just 10 minutes a day, and it can get delivered in your WhatsApp. So you're, you don't even have to go download anything. And you can do your grown up activity in it, your child can do their activity in it. And what it does is it allows for conversation to happen. Um, and we encourage that, right, you know, what you do not, you know, learning requires practice, learning requires community. Um, I often say, you know, one of the biggest hurdles we face is teaching something to children and their parents are telling them something different. You know, the biggest stakeholders of children are parents and teachers. So if they are not active stakeholders and helping us recognize human skills as important and practice along with the kids, most of the times we miss. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Ruchita. The answer is yes, we do have that. Oh, great. So we have another question for you, uh, which says that since 
what you say rings true. Why do schools still emphasize science, technology, engineering, and math? Have you tried conveying this to policymakers Absolutely. or content Absolutely. designers? Absolutely. So uh, that's changing. And COVID has been, you know, as terrible as it's been to the world, it has been the best thing that has happened to the education system. And there's not an educator who has been the things that we've been all been talking about for 10, 20, 30 years is now happening. So here's what's happened in the education system. Um, you know, it's kind of kind of <clears throat> a, a, a tipping point. And let's think about India and think about the new education policy of, uh, uh, of um, uh, mm -hmm. Prime Minister Modi, which talks about for the first time, bringing in critical thinking, problem solving. Education has been using a different vocabulary than the job market. And that's why most people, young people, when they graduate, they can't find jobs. And that's why most companies say, I have to spend all of this money upskilling them. So you have education speaking one language, the job market speaking an entirely different language. And what has happened is COVID has created this bridge where all of a sudden educators are being forced, really being forced to relook at how they're educating children. What are they educating you know, students in? Because if the success of an education institution, I mean, I would ask you a question, if you had to measure an inst education is institution by how many of their graduates got jobs, how successful are most educational institutions? Not very successful, if that was one of the real measures. So um, it's happening now, Roshita, it's happening now by many companies in the world. So think of some of the big companies, uh, PwC, all the consulting companies, even some of the universities, they're no longer requiring resumes or transcripts. So there are many universities right now that don't no longer even wants to see your high school transcript to get in. So that whole focus on if you're an A, you're going to get into somewhere, um, uh, that's not happening. Um, you know, that's going to change very much. Getting a job and saying, here is my resume and here are all the fine institutions I went to and experienced, that's all changing. So we're going to see a huge change in this space, Richita, in the next one to five years. And that's where kind of Gleek comes in, you know, I'm uh, as, you know, the proud patent owner and the measure, you know, and um, we're plugged in now, you know, to give you an example to the monster job portal in India. So if any of you download the monster app and you go for a job right now, you see the Gleek index and anyone who checks and proves their human skills get to the top of job search. That's just to give you an example of where the world is heading. It's a real diversity and inclusion. We're leveling the curve of saying, it doesn't matter if you come from a tier three city, it doesn't matter if you got the best education, if you can prove to me you have the human skills to perform that job because that's 85% of the job. And I see you're a quick learner. I can give you those hard skills, right? Um, so that's where the world is heading. Amazing. Thank you. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I would just like amazing... to add a little word of dissent here that while employability skills and human skills are extremely important, I don't think we can avoid thinking about the technical skills. Because Absolutely. I feel that, uh, you know, uh, I think a large problem that comes up in countries like India also relates with the fact that very often technical skills are not adequate. And yeah. uh, that's a big problem, okay? When you don't have enough uh, technical skills and you try and fool your way through, that's also- Yeah, it's not an and or, or, right? It's it's. Yeah, it's not an or, right? Hard skills matter too. Absolutely. What I'm matter. saying though is that 85%, if I were to ask everybody in this room, who is the most exceptional doctor that you have ever come across? Or who is the most exceptional professor? Or who is the most exceptional engineer? I bet you the person you name and I ask you why, you're not going to tell me something about their technical skills. You're actually going to say something like, you know, it's that person and the way they make me feel. It's that person and the way that they think and their creative abilities. It's that person. So it's always the human skills. That's the differentiator. But hard skills matter too, right? So a house needs structure, right? If we go back to the architecture, you need walls. But think about all the space, which is where we operate, collaborate, communicate. That's the 85% of the human skills. Thank you so much, Sally. And thank you so much, Mr. Sridhar and Sujata. What... I would like to do is now, while there are many amazing questions, but we'll, we'll figure out a way to reach you so that everybody gets their answers. But we are running short of time. And I would like to invite Shalanta Maskarinis to propose the vote of thanks. Shalanta, can we have you? Thank you so much, Rishita. Thank you, Ms. Alian. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sujata Sriram and Mr. R. Sridhar for your highly effective presentations. 
We applaud the work you all do and thank you for participating in, in the inaugural session of the Global Tipping Point Summit, Rethinking Parenting. Our thanks also go out to Ms. Ruchita Dhar for anchoring the session so expertly. We also extend our gratitude to all our participants who have joined us today from all over India and different countries of the world. Do attend all the remaining sessions of the summit, which have been scheduled for weekends only up to January 31st, 2021. We need you to work collaboratively with us to bring about the change we want to see in the world. Do also remember to join us tomorrow from 4 to 5.15 p.m. on a session on the changing faces of addiction in and post-pandemic by Father Joe Pereira and his wonderful team of change facilitators. Tomorrow's session will also be anchored by Aditi Hazra Ganju, the co-founder of SAP Health. Uh, do remember to like and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as YouTube. Until then, stay happy, stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>